Our uh, next speaker is uh, Caden Hazard from Rice, and he's going to be uh, telling us about sticky dimension or synthetic dimension <laughs> and sticky dimensions. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Is the speaker on? Okay. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for surviving John's cocktail night and still coming. It's actually really good attendance today. I'm surprised. So um, I was surprised I made it. Uh, so uh, and I liked your your switch here. Uh, what sticky dimensions and synthetic collisions? Um, we could probably make that work. Let's talk. Um, so. I'm going to tell you, I'm a theorist, so I do work on lots of things, but I'm going to try to give you a bird's eye view of the things in my group that are going on with cold molecules, since this is a cold molecule conference. And the two big things that we're working on are these two topics listed here. So the synthetic dimensions is going to be about um, taking some things that we've heard about, say, spin models, and extending them in very natural ways uh, that I can think uh, that I will show you, hopefully convince you, really leads to novel types of physics. And in the second regard, uh, we've heard a lot about sticky collisions at this conference. It's been really exciting to see what's changed, especially in the last like week of how people have been thinking about this. Uh, but, uh, but there's very little recognition, I think, of the fact that sticky collisions are important not just for loss, not just for their intrinsic interest in the few body sense, but they drastically affect how quantum matter behaves. If you have a, a molecular gas with sticky collisions, it's going to behave, it's going to have phases of matter and dynamics that are totally different than would be predicted from non-sticky collisions. And so if you're a many-body theorist, which is how I like to imagine myself at least, then, um, somebody's laughing, thank you, um, <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> and, um, so you just can't ignore these. If you ignore these, you're going to get all wrong answers, and not just in some quantitative sense, but qualitatively. And so I'll try to make that case and show you our preliminary efforts of not just ignoring these things. Um, since who knows how far I'll get, I want to show my collaborators right up front. There are a lot of great people here. Bryce Gadway, an uh, experimentalist at UIUC, has been heavily involved in all of the synthetic dimensions work, and he makes... Well, he does his best to make sure that I don't make any crazy statements. And uh, Bhuvanesh Sundar is a postdoc in my group. Absolutely fantastic. Invite him to give a talk, and he can really go into detail with this stuff. Um, but he's led the synthetic dimensions effort. And then there's been a whole assortment of people who I've collaborated with on the um, sticky collisions or chaotic collisions. So we're going to have this two-course meal. We have, um, we're going to hear about strings and topology are going to be two of the unifying factors of of these synthetic dimensions, which sounds very exotic, and I don't know if it is, but certainly the words are cool to say. And there's not so much different about our strings from the strings here. So we'll have our appetizer and dessert, and we'll skip the main course because it's Friday, Thursday, whatever today is. Um, OK, so that's a string. We'll figure out what that is. So what is a synthetic dimension? I guess we all know here, but let's just make sure we're on the same page. Also, feel free. Stop me at any point. If I don't get to the end of my talk, I'm fine with that. Nobody will shed too many tears. Just let's chat about whatever you want to talk about. So um, this is a lattice. If we are doing solid state physics, you have a periodic potential. You have several sites that a particle can sit in. And you can maybe just as a cartoon, which we often use, think about this as here's a lattice site, here's a lattice site, here's a lattice site. And I just tell you where the particle sits. And that looks pretty similar to if I have a molecule, I have rotational states, and I can sit in all these different rotational states. Molecules have lots of rotational states. And so at least at the level of looking at Hilbert spaces, this lattice looks a lot like rotational states. The end. That is a synthetic dimension. So all the fancy nature papers, this is all they're doing Okay, at the single particle level. And... Um, and so these Hilbert spaces, spaces match up. You might be a little nervous in the lattice. Um, these are usually the different lattice sites are degenerate in energy or nearly degenerate in energy, whereas here there's a huge energy gap between the rotational states. But if you work in the rotating frame, all those energy differences go away and they don't really matter. Okay. So this tells us the Hilbert spaces are the same. This just looks like an extra dimension of space. And potentially you can use several rotational states. I would love to figure out what the exact number is that we can use in practice. Um, but if we can use three or four, we can already start doing interesting things. And 
if you just look at stability in microwave control, it's not totally crazy to think about a dozen or a hundred. And Bryce said I'm allowed to say a hundred, so I'll say a hundred. Um, so I don't think that's going to be easy. But again, if you can do three or four, we can get started along this road and do interesting things. Okay. So um, besides having the Hilbert space the same, there is actually another ingredient you need, which is you need the Hamiltonian to match up with the lattice Hamiltonian. And so in a real lattice, you have maybe some tunneling. I can go between nearest neighbor sites. And to engineer that in our synthetic dimension in a molecule, we use microwaves which couple adjacent um, rotational states. And this can be done because the rotational states are spaced anharmonically. You can spectroscopically address each of um, these transitions and control every one of these tunnelings independently. Okay. So the point is that I can now have this synthetic dimension, and I can control every tunneling matrix element completely independently, just by sending in microwaves. So um, it's easy to generate several microwaves. It's easy for a theorist to say, but I think even in an experiment, it's pretty easy to generate microwaves, at least comparatively to sending in a bunch of lasers or something. Um, and there are very sophisticated techniques, I'm told, these direct digital synthesis devices in which you can type in a waveform and control microwaves just by typing in what set of microwaves you want to apply up to, I don't know, 10 gigahertz or something, maybe higher. Um, and this lets you engineer whatever lattice structures you want in the synthetic dimension. So for example, the simplest one is maybe we use this set of levels, and this looks like a one-dimensional chain in the synthetic dimension. And uh, you might worry that things will leak out of this chain, but actually if you're in a, uh, if you have a magnetic field on it, breaks some of these degeneracies, and every, and these levels are no longer degenerate, it means you can't leak out of this manifold. There are no resonant processes to cause you to leave this manifold. Okay. So if you start in this manifold of states, you'll stay in this manifold of states, and it really looks like a one-dimensional system. But we don't have to do something boring like a 1D chain. We could do a ladder, or we could do a ring. We can do periodic boundary conditions in our synthetic dimension. We can control not only the amplitude of these tunnelings, but we can control the phases of these tunnelings. And as a result, if we want a gauge field in our ring, you just type it in. You control the phases of these microwaves, and you get a gauge field. And you can make this gauge field dynamic. You can put disorder on it. You can do all of these fun things. And what this means is that we can engineer gauge fields, we can engineer effective spin-orbit coupling, we can engineer topological band structures. And in fact, my claim is that you should be able to engineer any topological band structure that you want, as easy as just controlling these microwave phases. So this is, um, this is a famous table from the classification of uh, topological band structures. Uh, this is Shinsei Ryu and Schneider, and I forget the other author, but there's a reviews of modern physics I stole this from. And this is a table of all the types of topological matter on this axis in, a, in each dimension. So this is zero dimensions, one dimension, three, two dimensions, so on. Seven dimensions, I know you're really curious about, is also up there. Um, and this zero, if it's not topological, Z or 2Z, something else if it is to, uh, topological. And so what you could do in the lab is you could just go through, say you make a one-dimensional chain or something like this in your synthetic dimension, and on Monday you create a class A3 topological system, and then on Tuesday you come down and type in different microwave pattern, and you get a class D system, and you could see every topological band structure that's ever been made. And so I'll tell you a little bit about one of these, the SSH uh, class, but there are other classes of topological band structures which have never been seen in nature before. Nobody's ever observed these in nature. And there are sort of fundamental reasons why they're hard to observe in solid state, getting a sort of non-interacting system that also has strong spin-orbit coupling and other things like this, but there's, they would be as easy as anything else to realize here in this synthetic s setting. So even if you just have a single molecule, non-interacting mo molecule, there is an opportunity for you to go create topological band structures that nobody's ever seen in nature before. And I think that's pretty cool. Okay, so let me just tell you about the simplest case of that. This is what's known as the SSH model, the schrieffer heger model. This was introduced as a model, I guess, of polyacetylene, so this is an unexpected connection to a, a, a chemical molecule conference. Um, but uh, the idea is that you have this lattice structure in which you have strong bonds and weak bonds, and they alternate. So you have strong bond, weak bond, strong bond, weak bond. And you can go solve this, and what you get is a band structure of energies that looks like this. 
So you have some smeared out uh, valence band and some smeared out conductance band, and there's a gap between them. And in this gap lives a pair of states that are edge states. And so by edge states, I mean these live at the edge of your system. So here it's at the edge of your rotational spectrum, whatever set of rotational states that you want to couple. And the really remarkable thing about this, and I think that this is something that's easy to appreciate as an AMO physicist, is that these edge states give you robust two-level systems. Okay, so in particular, if I were to go and perturb all of these tunneling matrix elements, you know, I can't control these precisely, so let's say I just randomly change all of them by 1% or 2%. It turns out that these edge states are totally unperturbed in energy up to exponentially small corrections, exponentially in the synthetic dimension size. So you have a two-level system that is, it doesn't care if you're flooding the system with microwave noise. Okay, and so that sounds like something that we would care about. It means we can put a superposition of these two edge states and store quantum information in an intrinsically robust way. That's what's generating a lot of the excitement about these topological band structures and so on. Okay, we'll actually come back to this. So everyone is okay with the idea this would be a way of getting robust two-level systems? Awesome, oh, thanks. Thank you to the head nodders in the audience. Okay, cool. Okay, so... But is it, since I said I fashioned myself a mini-body theorist, um, I can't talk too much about single particle physics, right? The, the single particle physics, I think, would be fantastic. You go do an experiment, maybe um, see some new things, but, is, but we understand it pretty well. But once I had interactions, things become more mysterious. And we wanted to know if we just take the simplest case of a synthetic dimension. So I take a synthetic dimension, forget all the topology and stuff, I just make the tunnelings uniform in the synthetic dimension. <coughs> And I turn on interactions in a way that would be natural to the molecules. What's going to happen in this system? And so the interactions, when you project the dipole-dipole interaction into this, um, so I'm just picking out, a, again, a one-dimensional chain of the rotational states, what you get are these spin-swap processes. So if I'm in rotational state N, and N plus 1 on the first molecule, and in the opposite state um, uh, on the second molecule, so if one's an N plus 1 and the other's an N, they just swap to N and N plus 1. That turns out that is the only interaction process that happens in zero field. So things like these other things I've drawn here are forbidden. And I'm also thinking about working in a deep enough lattice that there is no tunneling. So we don't have to worry about loss. We don't have to worry about sticky collisions. None of that. And so everything should be nice and robust. And with KRB, they manage to see lifetimes of like 25 seconds trapped in this lattice. So really, you have a lot of time to work with and see the physics here. And... So what we want to do is figure out what the interactions actually do. There's a formula, if you like that kind of thing. Um, people have seen these interactions at Jilla in the KRB experiments. So this isn't some far-off fantasy seeing interactions in combination with these synthetic dimensions. Now, at the time, they didn't call it synthetic dimensions. They called it um, a spin one-half model because they were only using two of these states, in which case it is a spin one-half model. But as you add more and more states, it's no longer to really natural to talk about it as a spin model. That's a claim that I'm happy to argue with you about, but um, but I sincerely believe it. So, um, But anyway, there are the experiments. They see the interactions. This seems like a natural next step. We just have to go from 2 to 3, 4, 5, see what happens. And so what are they going to do? What are the interactions going to do? Well, to build up to the many-body physics, let's start with two particles. So at the two-particle level, to understand what's going to happen, we have these interactions which resonate me back and forth when I am in adjacent synthetic levels rotational levels, but if I'm far away, there's nothing to resonate me. So this looks like, well, when they're far away, nothing happens. They just have whatever energy they have, but when they're close, they can resonate. And in quantum mechanics, if you have a resonance between states, you can lower your energy. And so this means when the particles get close, they have a lower energy, and they can be bound together. So I can have a bound state forming between these two molecules, by which I want you to think, here's a lattice here's a lattice here's the synthetic dimension in each of these molecules, and if they're far apart, nothing happens. If they're close, they're resonating back and forth, which sort of attracts them together in the synthetic dimension. And so that's drawn here. If you have um, tunneling but very weak interactions, you just have two delocalized molecules moving up and down. Strong interactions, they bind together and have to move together. And in fact, for two molecules, there's a critical interaction strength where this happens. So now you can tack on more and more molecules. Think about a one-dimensional real space chain of molecules, each with these synthetic dimensions, and ask what happens. And what you get, it turns out, actually looks like what I'm drawing down here. So here's one molecule, and 
Uh, when I add a second molecule over here on the next site, it wants to sit next to this one in the synthetic dimension, next to the first one in the synthetic dimension. But the third one wants to sit next to the second one, and the fourth one wants to sit next to the third one, and so on. So there's sort of two logical conclusions. Maybe you could have a random walk going through synthetic dimension space, or maybe it's just flat. And it turns out when you do the calculations, and we've now done this with approximate methods, but also in one dimension we have numerically exact DMRG results, and there's a special point where you can actually write down an exact analytic solution in 1D. And all of these show you that you actually do bind together and form this flat object. So in this case you have an effectively two-dimensional space. You have one real dimension and one synthetic dimension, and the system spontaneously collapses down to a one-dimensional object. And this is what I'm calling a string. It's a one-dimensional object that lives in a higher dimensional space. And it fluctuates around and does all kinds of quantum fluctuation-y stuff. We actually don't understand the nature of this string very well. As you tune parameters, the string will unbind, and you get phase transitions between string phases and, un and unbound phases. So I think this is really rich mini-body physics. I could give you a whole talk about this. But I just want to throw this out there and say I think this is a new thing for us to explore. What is the nature of this string? It turns out that there are bosons and anti-bosons that live on this string, so it starts sounding really complicated. Um, and, you know, we didn't go looking for this. This was just what's the sort of simplest thing that you can set up with these synthetic dimensions. So I think it's a really rich playground. Um, we don't know the nature of the quantum phase transition. We don't have an effective field theory for it, for example. And these are all things that we're trying to figure out. So, um, yeah, I'm just skip that. But this open question is what I want to le leave you with. We have these strings, and we would like to know what is the effect of the quantum fluctuations on this string. And I actually think it's not all that um, unrealistic to think about actually going and doing these experiments. And we've thought about how to actually prepare uh, systems near the ground state um, and have some calculations on that as well. Okay, so just one final thing about these synthetic dimensions. Remember our SSH model here? Before I told you about the one molecule version, you'd get these edge states with some valence and conduction bands. So now if we turn on interactions and we have lots of molecules, there's this edge state manifold. It looks like a spin one half. We said you had a robust two level system. Each spin, each molecule looks like a spin one half. And now when I couple them with dipole-dipole interaction, at least I, if now I'm going to think about an electric field, I can ask what, um, what models I get. So the first thing you have to check is that if I prepare things in edge states, they stay in the edge states. But it turns out that's actually true over a certain time scale that can be arbitrarily long if you work in the right parameter regime. And so we project down these edge states, ask what model you get, and what you get is an Ising model. Okay, that sounds really disappointing, because an Ising model is like the most boring thing. If you wanted an Ising model, maybe it's not the most boring thing, but if you wanted an Ising model, this would not be the way you'd go realize it, right? You would just pick two rotational states and do something with your molecules, or you'd go do a trapped ion experiment or something. There are other ways to get Ising models. But there's something pretty remarkable about this Ising model, which is, again, inherited from the topological nature of these edge states. When you turn on noise in the microwaves, this Ising model doesn't get perturbed. So in a normal realization of an Ising model with ultra-cold molecules, if I perturb things by sending on some microwaves, what's going to happen is those levels are going to shift around, they're going to get mixed, and so I will add transverse fields to this that are maybe fluctuating in time and space. I will add longitudinal fields which are maybe fluctuating in time and space, and I might even add XY type interaction terms. But in this case, because the spin one half is realized by this topological band structure, all of those terms are forbidden. They're exponentially small. So this is a way of giving you Ising models that are robust to all those perturbations. And given the importance of the Ising model to generating cluster states and GHC states, like Norm mentioned this morning, uh, thanks for setting me up for that, Norm. Uh, the uh, you know it, maybe there is some virtue in having a robust Ising model. And so I'd really like to think about this. Now, the thing is, normally I don't think the limitation to your coherence and fidelities is due to being flooded by microwave radiation in your chamber. But still, at a fundamental level, I think this is interesting to play with and to think about if it could be turned into something useful. OK, so that this actually kind of wraps up the synthetic dimensions part, maybe before turning to sticky collisions. If there were any questions people wanted to ask about this, now would be a good time, because we're going to shift gears pretty strong.
Yeah. So, um, you know, so for molecules, we already have a fermion and phonon. Yeah. Model, does that matter to you? Not at all. So, because in the case I'm thinking about, everything is pinned to a lattice site. Remember, I didn't want these tunneling processes to allow collisions. Um, the, it does not matter at all if the, bo if the molecules are bosons or fermions. You'll get the same models. Now, it's an interesting question. You could combine this with allowing the molecules to tunnel around, and hopefully the loss processes aren't too bad in this case for whatever reason. And in that case, then it would become important. And people have studied this quite a bit for the spin one half case. So if you have an n equal two state synthetic dimension, in fact, we've written some papers showing that, um, that you know, the fermionic system changes quite dramatically due, it, well, anyway, we've studied the phase diagram of the spin one half system for fermions, and you get very different results if you do bosons versus fermions in that case. Yeah. Well, I noticed that different people define sticky collision differently. Yeah, well, okay, I haven't, yeah. Give me, uh, let's see if there are any questions about the synthetic dimensions, and then we'll talk all about synthetic, about sticky collisions, yeah. The, Yep. Edge states in, the, yep. in the synthetic dimension. Mm -hmm. Presumably, there's some kind of like minimum length of this string before this starts to be a useful sound. Useful for what? Well, <laughs> I just, like I can have a string with only two elements. That's not really a, uh, a synthetic dimension. But presumably, that doesn't have sure. edge states. Sure. Sure. So, so, so for the like strings that. that I was talking about, all of that is actually for uniform tunnelings. So we haven't <laughs> thought about how to combine the SSH with strings yet. I actually think I actually think you do still get strings there, but but um, in this uniform case where you have the strings, how big does the synthetic dimension have to be before you think it's a string? <laughs> uh, strictly academically, infinite probably. <laughs> you know, you really want to say that the width of this is finite when the synthetic dimension size goes to infinity. But these numerics I showed you, which I didn't really talk you through the graph because time is also finite, um, the, you see clear signatures of this even for, this is n equals 7, 8, 9, 10. I think you'd, you'd see clear signatures even for 4 or 5. You'd see, you'd see the remnants of the string phase transition, for example. Um, now, what, what happens is that if my string is with 3 and my synthetic dimension is with 5, how do I know it's really a string? Well, you know, I don't, it's just a language in some sense, but there's still a phase transition in that model, and and it's still maybe an interesting phase transition that inherits something from the infinite size model. In the, in the SSH model, you're talking about the end where you have these protected spin half things. Mm -hmm. Then how long does the how many states have to be in a synthetic dimension before this starts to get the protection? Yeah. Uh, so this is where you, you in principle, need a lot. It's exponentially small in the size of the system. So um, so it depends how well you want to protect these things. So there will be pertur pertur nah, there will be perturbations here that I'm saying get forbidden. The point is they're actually multiplied by e to the minus size of the synthetic dimension divided by a core by a decay length that's just determined by band structure parameters. And actually you can make that decay length very small here. But it's just controlled by the ratio of the tunnel lengths, right? That's exactly right. Yep. No, no. Uh, so it turns out if you were to look at spin swap interactions, so not the uh, electric field version, if you're in zero electric field, and you were to ask what they look like in this manifold, maybe, you know, so I said there is zero here, there may be other similar things you can do. Those can get suppressed, but actually for this direct uh, Ising type exchange, it's maybe a factor of two different, but it doesn't change with the size of the system. All right, maybe I'll talk about some stickiness then. Um, okay, that's a sticky collision. Um, you, these these pictures were really funny at 2 a.m. when I was making this talk. Um, the, um, so <laughs> you're asking what I mean by a sticky collision, and actually I, I want to use the word pretty vaguely. All I mean by it is that we have a very high density of states, and you have to ask high compared to what. 
And for me, because my point here to advocate is that it's important for many body physics, what I want it to be is large compared to whatever energy scale controls your many body physics. So um, I'll get right, well, it's actually on this slide what that might be. Um, let's get there. So here are some sticky collisions. Anytime you have collisions, there's a range of collision energies that, for example, is set by the temperature. And this is stolen from the Maley papers that we all know and love. Um, if the interaction, if the resonances are dense enough, and maybe let me come back to density estimates and things, but let's just pretend you have a super, super high uh, density of resonances. Then at 100 nanokelvin, I'm going to be averaging over several resonances, maybe more than several resonances. And, um, and so that's certainly something you're going to have to account for. It breaks our usual picture of how scattering works. Um, and they did these calculations in the Maley papers. And exactly what temperature that's important at depends on your estimate of the density of resonances, but there's some temperature. But my point is that when you have a many-body system, it's not just temperature that matters. The density also sets an energy scale. So the simplest way to think about this is take a non-interacting Fermi gas, you have a Fermi energy, and if that Fermi energy is 100 nanokelvin, even at zero temperature, you're going to be probing several of these resonances. So if you want to understand the many-body physics, even at zero temperature, you absolutely have to account for the fact that it's not just a delta function interaction, maybe with dipolar, that there's really some stickiness going on at zero range. So that's what I mean by stickiness, that you cannot treat this as a one-channel model, as a delta function or delta function plus dipole interaction type collision process to understand, say, the ground state or some thermal equilibrium phase. Okay? Um, so also there's a lot in lattices. A lot of my work has been focused on lattices, partially because that's where we can, ex five including questions or five plus questions? Five plus questions. Oh, good, okay, great. So, yeah, so um, the, um, a lot of my work has actually been in lattices. I'm now nervous about a lot of that work because of the light assisted collisions, but, uh, or I, light assisted collisions, is that a good phrase for the light assisted decay of the, complexes. Uh, anyways, we all know what I'm talking about. The bad stuff that light does to these sticky things. Um, the So I'm a little nervous about that, but I was told I could blame Ed. I don't know. Yeah, I said that, you know, we'll make a CO2 lattice at 10 microns, and then you'll just have to cool down to whatever tunneling scale that is, and maybe that won't have such bad losses. Um, I don't know. This needs to be revisited, the lattice physics, but um, let's just avoid that today. So here's a, to give a sense of what we have to accomplish to understand the many body physics, here's a slide from a talk I gave like five years ago, not about molecules, this was about, whoops, about atoms. And this is the standard thing we always do. We say, well look, you have, this is what the potential looks like. This range is really short, it's a few nanometers. So I can just pretend it's a delta function, or maybe a square well, or whatever is convenient for me to do my many body theory calculations of, right? I, if I want to treat a gas, I definitely don't want to treat a gas with a Leonard-Jones interaction. It's actually quite hard to do this. Um, but a delta function interaction is kind of nice. I can do perturbation theory pretty easily and things like this. So having this effective short-range interaction uh, rather than dealing with a microscopic interaction is absolutely crucial. And I think all these many-body theorists who have been interested in cold atoms, if they had to start with a Leonard-Jones potential or a more realistic potential than that even, they probably never would have gotten interested in cold atoms. But a great appeal of it was its simplicity and the universality of everything just being described by this number, the scattering length. And so we need the analogous thing for molecules. And what we've done in that front is showing that in fact you can write down delta function interactions and square well interactions um, that can parametrize sticky collisions relying only on the separation of length scales between short range and long range. It, it's This is not very astonishing, but it's nice to have explicit formulas. And it turns out there are some tricky issues with regularizing the delta functions we had to overcome. So. Sticky issues with, okay. Anyway, so uh, the um, once we have these effective interactions, we can make progress, but we still don't know the interaction parameters, right? Just like we don't know the scattering length, you have to go measure it in an experiment or predict it from ab initio calculations. Here, we still haven't solved that step. We know the form of the interactions, but there are parameters that go in those interactions we still have to determine. And, um, and one way to do that would be if we could do real ab initio calculations, we could go do it, or if one of you wants to go measure, um, 
sticky collisions and, and can do this precisely, and we have some ideas for doing this, you could parameterize the interaction similar to the way you do with the scattering light. Okay, but let me give you an example before talking about how to get those parameters um, of how this might actually affect many body physics, having these sticky collisions. And to take what is maybe the simplest example of a question about many body physics that we would like to address, we could ask, do I get a BEC for an interacting molecular Bose gas? Weakly interacting. So this is theoretically the easiest problem you could imagine. You know, it's almost not interacting we just have weak interactions and do some perturbation theory. But the answer to this question is not actually known once you account for the sticky collisions. And so the issue is that imagine that BEC, and I'm making up numbers here, so the exact numbers don't matter. Imagine BEC works at 100 nanokelvin. That's a nice round number. Imagine my density of resonances is 1 nanokelvin. That means when I'm supposed to BEC, I'm actually going to be accessing 100 channels of these sticky collisions. And so should I really trust my calculations of the non-interacting system or for a simple delta function interaction? And clearly the answer is no. I have no reason to believe those calculations. I need to redo the calculations of an interacting BEC, including the stickiness. And we've, we're in the process of doing that. There are actually some nasty technical issues with this that are sort of surprising. But where we have solved this is in a simplified model, or in, at least in a model that we could get a handle on. We just kind of assume that all of the complexes were positive energy because it's hard to define equilibrium if you have negative energy complexes because everything just wants to go into the negative energy complexes. And then we could solve things numerically in 1D in a lattice using some numerical techniques. And what we found, actually this is an even simpler example, but what we found was that where you normally have a superfluid, it gets suppressed. So what you end up with, even in the ground state, is a system that has fluctuations, number fluctuations. So it has a uh, transport of particles. It's like a fluid, but it does not have coherence. So it's not a mod insulator. It's not a superfluid. It's something in between. And I would conjecture that maybe there is some analog of this region in the finite temperature phase diagram of a real molecular BEC. That you hit 100 nanokelvin, the naive theory says that you should get a BEC, but you don't, at least until you get so cold that you're only resolving a single present. Okay. But really, I think this is an open question. We as a community need to stop ignoring this. I think the many body theorists have been really scared by sticky collisions, and it's just some few body stuff that just want to ignore it. But I don't think we can do that. Okay. So uh, my final slide here goes back to if we want to do the many body theory, we have the form of the interactions but we don't actually know what are the values of the interaction parameters. So how can we figure that out? And so um, Tease gave us some really nice work showing how to do ab initio calculations uh, for, for one molecule and do mass scaling and things for other molecules. What we had the same idea to make some crude approximations and try to get some scaling of, of the density of states. And what I wanted to do was test that. Very similar to how it was tested for one case with um, with these ab initio calculations. So th what we did is I certainly can't solve the scattering of two molecules in three dimensions. But I can solve the scattering of two molecules in one dimension. And I don't just mean their center of mass is in one dimension. I mean it's four atom problem. All of the atoms move in one dimension. And, you know, this is a totally just take this with a huge handful of salt, right? This is obviously not a realistic model, but the idea was we could test some of these simple scalings um, that you can derive analytically in this really simple setting. And if, if the approximations worked, this might be some evidence that the approximations have a chance at working in the three-dimensional system. So it turns out if you do these arguments very similar to what Tyus talked about for the one, this one-dimensional system, you get that the four-body density of states goes like root the depth of the two-body potential times the range of the two-body potential cubed. And um, you go test this with the numerics, and you see that indeed this fit to root D, that's the blue line, agrees very well with the calculations of row 4 coming from the numerics, those are the x's, and also the scaling with r naught cubed. The prefactors we didn't even try to get right because I think the 
approximations that go in are so dubious you shouldn't trust them. But this gives me some confidence that simple scaling laws like this, sure, maybe it's hard to determine what row four is for one species, but if you want to know how it depends on things like depth or molecular species, all you have to do is figure, plug in these numbers and then extrapolate to other species. Okay, also here's just a plot for the experts. You can see some chaotic to non-chaotic crossover as a function of the hyper radius, and so a lot of the features that you see in 3D are actually retained in this model. So with that, let me just conclude. I think ultra-cold molecules are a frontier for quantum matter, and I'm putting the bold on the quantum matter, and not just few body physics, but many body interacting states. And there are a couple examples. So let's take questions. All right, time for a quick question. We already have a few. So I guess I'll ask the uh, no, sort sure. of obvious yeah, one. Yeah. What's the, uh, what are you, what exactly do you think we have to worry about when we're talking about a Fermi gas that's going to, you know, probably access many more of these uh, mm -hmm. resonances as opposed to a Bose gas, which might be yeah, um, it's more it's an excellent question. So the um, so what what we know for the boson is that it really destroys the coherence of of the bosonic spatial superposition uh, for the fermions. My gut feeling is because there's not a coherence to destroy, they may actually be more robust to these states. Um, but we haven't done the calculations yet. But what's clear, you know, there have been famous predictions of P-wave superfluids, of interacting fermions uh, if in, in these dipolar systems. And I don't think there's any reason to believe this until we confirm that the sticky collisions don't matter for that, right? And I, so I think these are the next questions that somebody has to figure out. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's so get it. Can we get it?